Hello everyone, Jason Alea back here again and today we're going to be discussing the Suicide Squad in spoiler form. Now, if you have not seen the Suicide Squad yet, I would recommend checking out the film, then come back to watch my spoiler review. You have been warned, this is going to be full on spoilers. Now, I have a spoiler free review on my channel that you can check out. So, go look it up, <laughs> it's in my channel. Uh, so. The movie opens with Savant in a prison and we see what kind of his ability like is to hit targets pretty well. Uh, kind of like Deadshot, though I don't know much about Savant, but he played by Michael Rooker. We usually see this opening through his perspective in which we see the first team of Suicide Squad members going out onto a beach in which they are trying to infiltrate the island of Gorto Montes or whatever the island was, island was called and try to in, in, and try to like break into a secret project area uh, and it goes wrong basically. Want to know how it goes wrong? Every Suicide Squad member on that beach, apart from Harley Quinn and Rick Flagg, dies. Which means Javelin dies, Captain Boomerang dies, TDK dies, basically Mongo dies, and Savant dies. While the other squad members died in battle trying to get through the beach, Savant gets his head blown off because he got scared. But there were actually more of a... Uh, distraction for the actual Suicide Squad members that has infiltrated the beach now which is Ratcatcher 2, King Shark, Peacemaker, Giselba, and Polka Dot Man. After this in a brilliant credit scene in which we see a bunch of people with Amanda Waller in the office giving out money to each other because they bet off he's gonna die, uh, we then cut a few days late before this entire event in which we see Idris Elba in prison and he's trying to get recruited by Amanda Waller to be a part of the Suicide Squad. And Amanda Waller threatens him with his daughter going to jail possibly if he doesn't join. So he reluctantly joins, he's introduced to the Suicide Squad member, Drac Hatcher, King Shark, Peacemaker, and Polka Dot Man, and then they all go on the mission. It's a quick uh, 10 minutes scene in the prison which is very entertaining and very well establishes who the main character actually is. It is actually a criticism I have of the first film. You can you know that Will Smith is the lead because he's Will Smith but it doesn't feel like he is the lead. It doesn't feel like there's an actual main character in the first movie. Here could actually tell who the main character is and what story is revolving around. And you see his development with the squad throughout the entire film. And you see him change into a much different person by the end. It just Elba does a great job in the role and is actually one of my favorite main characters in any DC film. He is very funny, very entertaining has a very cool backstory and his back which is like him shooting Superman Superman with a kryptonite bullet. He was just a great main character to follow along. And his interaction with Peacemaker and them trying to one up each other by killing a bunch of uh, rebel rebellion people in Corto Matez in the jungle and it's like a dick measuring contest. It was it was great. I love it. Um, after that, we are then introduced back to Rick Flag, Joel, played by Joel Kinman once again, and he is saved by Sol Soria, who is in charge of this rebellion group in which the Suicide Squad members kill because they were ordered by Amanda Waller to do it, and she decides to help them, which is kind of a a flaw in my opinion in terms of not well paced that decision was. I mean I understood why like she is like she is 
determined to go up against the government and she's willing to get the help from the Suicide Squad members who, even though killed her rebellion in order to do that. I felt like there could have been at least a minute or two there, but it doesn't do anything major to detract from the story. The rest of the film was pretty well paced. After that, we're introduced to Thinker and the bad guys. Thinker is more memorable than the other bad guys. I didn't. I, there's, there's standard bad guys. Not much spoiled there. Um, so now the Suicide Squad members are trying to find the Thinker because he has information about Project Starfish in which the Squad members are trying to destroy. And they need him to get into uh, Jotunheim, which is the place where the squad members had to break in. So they enter at a bar where he usually goes to from time to time and they dance around a bit, they banter off with one another. It was this whole scene, I could see people maybe being a little bored by it, but for me, I love it when a movie like this goes crazy in its first and third act, but in its second act settles down a few things quite a bit. You, and just points little bits of action here and there, but it's usually time to let the characters breathe, talk about themselves with one another, and it was just still entertaining because the characters I really did care about, most notably Ratcatcher 2 and Pokedot Man. Pokedot Man having a very tragic backstory revolving around his mother his, and his siblings and how they were being tested on when they were younger and how some of them survived, some of them didn't, and he was one of the ones that survived. And while his mother is played brilliantly off by jokes, his actual backstory is actually pretty tragic, and it makes his constant demeanor of wanting to die in this mission, and not really caring what happens to him or anyone else around, much more understandable, because it's coming from a place where it's pretty dark in terms of how things played out. And with Ratcatcher 2, it's her and her father, Ratcatcher 1, played by Taika Waititi, who is in more of a cameo role here as Ratcatcher 1. You only see him in flashbacks, most notably 2. One on the bus in which Ratcatcher 2 is explaining her backstory to Idris Elba in which they're sharing each other's traumas in childhood which was a very good scene of them bonding with one another and you could kind of see Peacemaker in the back really taking it all in in which these characters are going through and not being like so reluctant to kill now or anything like that he, like he's taking time to think so that whole segment there was brilliant in my opinion and it really made Ratcatcher 2 a really good character and establishes Bloodsport's role in the film now in which he's now accepting some of these squad members as his friends and now actually trying to understand them as individuals and I love that about this film in the second act. After that we head on to a Harley Quinn subplot which could be, which in my opinion is the weakest subplot because it doesn't further the plot along. But as a character progression for Harley Quinn, I think it did a very good job. And Margot Robbie is still brilliant as the character. And she's even more psychotic than ever. Here she is having a bit of a romance after she, she gets captured by the bad guys with the head of the of the government of Corto Maltes and th they start forming a bond they had sex at some point and then Harley Quinn shoots him when he starts telling his plan out so after that she's being uh, interrogated by the general of Corto Mates, and he's now the new president. So he's trying to get information from her and who the Americans are and get information from the Suicide Squad. Uh, she plays dead, breaks free, kill all the soldiers inside. And then we see in the tra the scene in the trailers where the Suicide Squad, after a pretty brutal 
car crash scene, go into the city and try and rescue her. And it plays off the way you expect, as we saw in the trailer. Um, after that, the Suicide Squad makes a plan to infiltrate Jotunheim. And then they go in and try to set bombs everywhere. And it's at this point when they're about to get into its dirty little secrets. The movie reveals that the Americans were behind Project Starfish the whole time. And it makes Rick Flagg pretty mad. And I actually love this twist here. How the bad guys are being like controlled by even worse people who are trying to cover up something that is they did in their part which was pretty terrible but Peacemaker it, is really determined to finish the mission and wants to destroy this, this hard drive in which contains all the information while Rick Flagg wants to show the world the truth and it creates this conflict in this entire fight scene which actually works for the story because at this point you don't know who's gonna die you don't know who's gonna survive now because of the opening scene and so anything at this point can happen now Starro has escaped this fight breaks out and Rick Flag dies I was actually surprised by that and while Peacemaker is trying to catch Rat Catcher who during the battle gets the hard drive and tries to run away from it but fails. We cut to the rest of the squad planting out bombs everywhere. Uh, King Shark is having fun with the little fishies and it's actually a good scene because he feels like he's now making friends with some for, with some fishes who are like his own but but <laughs> oh my god the best part about this entire scene, I forgot to mention, Milton. Milton is a character that I forgot about in the film. He is important for their traveling, but not much else. We see him in the scene trying to help out the squad, but we are like, why is he even there? And when he gets killed, the rest of the squad is like, who's Milton? Like, why is he even here? like the movie was self-aware at the exact right moment and pokes fun at itself. This was comedy done right. This was self-aware comedy done right and I love it. And after the bombs were accidentally set off too early by Pokemon Man, we then see the rest of the squad trying to escape this explosion while King Shark is being eaten by these little fishies now and being shot by the bad guys. Uh, Bloodsport falls all the way down from the top of the building to the bottom comes face to face with Peacemaker now at the right point which we left off from late from later then they have this uh, western style stare down in which they're about to shoot each other and it was awesome and it actually uh, it actually closes a it's actually a payoff of a scene earlier in which uh, Peacemaker talks about small bullets going through large bullets. Blood Sports bullet, which is a smaller bullet than Peacemaker's, goes through his bullet and kills him. And I love it. I love that little twist there. And Peacemaker now and off. I was. I don't know who's gonna die next. I don't know what's gonna happen next with Star now escaping in this final battle. Now that the mission is over, technically. The rest of the squad could go back and turn their back away from Star Wars destroying these people's homes in Corto Maltes, right? No, the squad knowingly going to fight Star Wars, even though they know that they could die by Amanda Waller pushing the buttons for abandoning the mission. Someone in the office hits Amanda Waller in the head and puts her out for a few minutes basically, enough time for the squad members to fight Starro. At this point, Bloodsport has now become the leader in which he made a Waller promises he will make him, she will make him, and 
he is, and he starts leading the squad, telling him what to do to and planning out how they're gonna fight Starro. But along the way, while Pokemon Man is doing his best to fight Starro and imagining him as his mother, which was very funny. I love how it transitioned from the squad being his mother to people grinding on him being his mother to now Starro being his mother. That was a big progression. Now, he's dead. And now, I do not know what's going to happen because the rest of the squad members could actually die. Even though they can't get their bombs de detonated yet. Uh, but, Ratcatcher 2 saved the day with the rats. She gets a flashback from Ratcatcher 1 in which she was a child with him when he was still alive. It was a touching moment. The music is swelling up and Starro dies. And it was a great ending after that. And when Amanda Water wakes up, uh, she makes a deal with Bloodsport to, in order to not reveal their dirty little secrets. He will keep the hard drive as, and as long as he does not detonate the bombs and kills them. And as long as she doesn't send her daughter away to prison then the squad members won't release this hard drive to the world. So now she has to agree to those terms and she looks at her team like, I'm gonna get ya. The movie ends with the team flying back home and that's it. This was a very simple movie but it has a lot of twists and turns going on it that makes it unique and special. Like, I can't... I love this film. But it's hard to descri describe just how crude it is. I feel like I'm not saying much about it because there are so many funny parts in the film that I probably looked over in this review because I want to talk about the major spoilers. But seriously, this was very well paced. This was very funny. The characters were very likable. They had good development and character progression and the fact that you don't know who's gonna die makes these action sequences all the more intense because not only are they well filmed and well choreographed but there is a sense of urgency there's a sense of tension there that you don't see in a lot of other comic book movies and so that is what I love about this movie go check it out and if you have seen this movie, which if you have watched the rest of this spoiler review, I would assume that you have, uh, watch it again. It's worth it. I love this movie. You gotta go check it out again. It deserves it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please leave a like, subscribe, comment, and I will see you guys next time.